director for his work in The Fugitive. He now stars in two films this season. First, there is In the Valley of Elah by Paul Haggis, the director. It also stars Charlize Theron and Susan Sarandon. Then there is Joel and Ethan Cohen's No Country for Old Men. That film is the centerpiece of the New York Film Festival. A.O. Scott of the New York Times on In the Valley of Elah, quote, there is something inarguable, something irreducibly honest and right about Mr. Jones's performance. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. I like that. I too. like that kind of you talk. Know, I That's am great. pleased to have him back at this table. They, they, listen, without flattering you. Yes, sir. They're all saying this, A, it's a great performance and somehow you have enhanced the character. That it was like you have permeated this character. Did well, you feel that way? Uh, no, I was just trying to do the best job I could. You know, Paul wrote a pretty good screenplay, and um, I tried to help him uh, see what he wanted to see. That's pretty much the way I look upon my job: read the screenplay, understand it as well as you can, and um, do your best to find out what the director wants to see, and then make it possible in every way you can for him to see it. Even though it might, in another case, in No Country for Old Men, be based on a book written by someone you like and admire very much, Cormac McCarthy. Oh, yes, sir. No different. Same thing. Look at the text. Try to see what the character's about and do the best you can. Yeah. Uh, and also try to uh, figure out what the director might want to see and then uh, make it possible for, insofar as you can for him to see it. So what was he looking for in Hank Deerfield? I think ultimately we were looking for a couple, for maybe two different things. He, he liked the character a lot more than I did. Really? Yeah. Um, well, what did he like about him and what did, didn't you like about him? Well, he, I mean, he, he thought the guy was salt of the earth, the all-American man, ultimately the admirable common man of America. And um, whose life is upside down because his son is killed. Yeah, exactly. And there were elements in the character that I don't like. Like? Um, this character is blindly patriotic without thought. Yeah. Well, that's certainly not you. And he's um, ethnocentric, uh, which is a, a very a polite way to say bigot. <laughs> right. right. So, um, and, and those are things that I, I, I really didn't like. But does so he, he sought out the likable yeah. uh, qualities in, in a person with those handicaps. That's what he wanted to see, which is a pretty sophisticated way of looking at it, I, I, I determined finally. Um, I have such disgust for those things that I, you know, probably played more toward the uh, disgusting villain um, than, than, than he wanted. But, he goes, but we worked it out. But he, the, your character goes from where you want him to go, doesn't he? He goes from the, the, the wrong place to the right exactly place. Exactly right. And, and it my, all works out. And the, well, my point is, the worse he is, the more interesting the journey is. Yeah. Well, he, um, he begins to rethink um, blind, unthinking patriotism that might lead you to um, war let's say, uh, without any thought. And, and from a place of, um, I can only say racial prejudice, to a more open-minded place. And um, that, was, um, that was the journey, and, and, and I, I, I'm hoping, and I believe we made it. You did. Is it, by definition, an anti-war film? Because um, something happens that happens in war. Well, an, an anti-war film is uh, look, a, a big term. It's a big concept. And this is about people who live in Tennessee and in New Mexico who are involved in a war. Uh, so I, I would hesitate to put such a wide, generic uh, well, I mean, so, you know, some people term was, on it. Yeah, but it, I mean, using different circumstances, which is a return from war to make statement about war. Yeah, well, we have kids coming back from war who are badly injured. And, um, and that's worthy of our consideration now. Um, and, and some other medium, let's say, than, than television, if you'll forgive me. Um, it, it's worthy of consideration in literature and, and, and in movies in order to put it into a narrative context that might somehow 
um, make it a more personal experience than it, than than um, than than the television, and make you find a deeper truth, perhaps. Maybe because sometimes the television inures us to uh, personalizing what we see. It, it's because we watch it all day long, every day, and and it's. Um, It's difficult to think to take personally what we see on television sometimes, I think. And it takes away the harshness of it. It's almost it becomes... If it can be put into a dramatic uh, context, sometimes the information comes to us from a different direction and makes a different impact and, and approaches the truth maybe... Um, it helps to approach the truth maybe a little, a, a little bit closer. I mean, that's supposed to be the function of uh, theater. Uh, and... and um, I, movies also. The, the highest and best use for it. Any similarity between the character you play in No Country for Old Men and this character? They're both men who I, are... I, well, I hope not. You know, I, I, I pay more attention to trying to make all these characters different rather than the same. And I, I really don't give any thought at all to, uh, um, you know, a, a running theme, let's say, and, and, and then characters one chooses to play. No, I'm I not know, trying I know to be you don't, a persona. No, no, I, I know you know, don't do that, but sometimes you play characters that come or somewhere or, or look, they've been overwhelmed by an environment, they find out that there's a world out there they don't know or understand. That's clearly what happened in yeah. No Country for Old Men. Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Right? Uh-huh. And in this case, um, Hank Deerfield finds himself in a world that he doesn't really know or understand. There are yeah. things about it. Yeah, but... That happens to all of us every day. Yeah. Take a look at this. This is a scene first from uh, In the Valley of Elam. Here it is. Mike was the one who wanted to join. I sure as hell didn't encourage it. Yeah, living in this house, he never could have felt like a man if he hadn't have gone. Both of my boys, Hank, you could have left me one. Um, one of the Cohen brothers said about it, said, you added more acid to the character hmm. than was there in the novel. I, I read the, um, I, Cormac's a friend of mine, I read I all of his it. books. I know it. And, and, and read all the criticisms it said. And read all the criticisms, and I, I read that book, and that's, you know, the character that I played is the way I read it as applied to um, Joel and Ethan's screenplay. And certainly didn't set out to add acid. Maybe, maybe they read the, the book differently than I did. The Coen Brothers. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah. It is said that you insisted it be set in West Texas. I, I suggested the obvious, that you, that, that you can't, that you, it'd be silly to um, try to uh, create a stand-in or find a stand-in for the Trans-Pecos, that is to say the country in Texas on the west side of the Pecos River. There's nothing like it anywhere else in the Southwest. Um, and to tr uh, try to fake it. Would, would 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 be a mistake. Um, it's very hard, for example, for me um, as a child of West Texas to watch the, the Searchers, which was set in West Texas. A great a, movie. Great movie, shot in Arizona. Yeah. And the set <laughs> just doesn't work <laughs> for me. And 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 it's going to work for fewer and fewer people as time goes by. And I, I tell them they just you know they'd be silly if they tried to fake it. I didn't yell at them or insist at it on anything. Um, I, I Might did, they have had a different interpretation? That They want to shoot it all in New Mexico because of the rebates. Oh, that's a governmental thing? Yeah, you get tax rebates. And, and Mex New Mexico makes it much easier to shoot in New Mexico than Texas does. Texas only woke up three or four months ago and decided that they would give a 5% tax rebate. See, I'm surprised at that because Texas has always had a lot of movies that have been made in Texas, haven't they? Yeah, but they're being outstripped by Louisiana and New Mexico now. Who North are, Carolina to a degree, but yes, not certainly. Local. Much, much more encouraging in New Mexico and and um, and Louisiana to um, come there and shoot films. They're much more inviting than, than Texas is. And as a result, we're losing our talent base. And people are moving out. They're moving either to uh, Albuquerque or um, New Iberia, New Orleans. You have always chosen to live in Texas. Yeah. Because it's home, because you have this other life, which is as a rancher. Mm -hmm. You need to do that. Well, you know, 
when I figured out that I could live anywhere I wanted to, I, in my wisdom, decided <laughs> to live at home. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> What's interesting about you, I mean, literally within 10 days after you left Harvard, you got a job. I did. And haven't stopped working since then. No. No, there was a, not really. No, I haven't no. stopped working. Has it been anything you've most wanted to do in this life of an actor that you haven't had a chance to do? Uh, when I was younger, I wanted to play Hamlet. Um, and then, but that was cured by becoming too old. <laughs> for well, you part. can still play Lear. Uh, maybe one day. Yeah. Well, I think I'm too young. Well, you are a bit now. But maybe one day. I but think I could play Big Daddy in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Would you want to? Oh, it's been, you know, I'd like to wait, let some time go by because mm. there have been a lot of productions here within the last few years. Here's what's interesting, too, about what critics are saying about your performance here. Uh, is that you don't, I mean, there is no sense of vanity about you in these performances. I mean, you... I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> you hope not because it's not about who you are. Uh, no, no, I didn't. Yeah. When you tell me the story of, of the character, your character who plays a sheriff who comes on a bad drug scene. And, and oh, you're... yeah. Uh, in, in No Country right. for Old Men. There was a um, kid... Uh, there's a kid from San Saba, Texas, by right. the way, who right. happens to be living in Sanderson. Right. Which is much further west. You're from San Saba? Yes. Right. Um, and um, he's out hunting antelopes, and he comes up upon a, uh, um, a battle site, a drug deal gone bad, with dead people laying everywhere, and a pickup full of um, uh, brown Mexican heroin and um, a track that's leading out across the desert. The last man standing, clearly, to him, he figures out, and he, tra he tracks that. He finds the fellow that uh, survived. He crawled up under a bush out on the, um, out, of, out in one of those pastures yeah. and uh, died, and he had a briefcase with $2 million in it with him. And the kid decides that uh, there's no good reason to leave that money there. No. <laughs> yes. And and the drama ensues. We have a story. Then we have a story. And we have a chase. A chase. Because the people whose money was want it. They, yeah. <laughs> we have two chases. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the, um, the people whose money he's got are chasing him. He's right. trying to get away. Right. And the sheriff right. of the local county, uh, kind right. of an old timer, is chasing both of them because he doesn't like any disturbance of the peace. Right. And this is all a world he doesn't quite understand, drug money and how drug lords operate. And the violence that comes with it. And the vi especially the violence. He, he, he really doesn't understand it. And um, it, it overwhelms him to some extent, except for the insight that he has into oh. the passage of time, which is revealed, I think, in the last um, few Closing scenes. May, may, maybe it's insight. Insight into what? I don't know. May, maybe it's insight into uh, how easily overwhelmed he's become. And maybe it's insight into uh, the future always being there. There's a, like all of Cormac's stories, there's a, the questions are more important than the answers. And there's a good question at the end of the movie. Um, so the movie looks like a good uh, chase movie, and it looks like a good um, drug and violence movie, and a good crime show. It's got all the elements. But like all of Cormac's work, there's many other dimensions to it. If you call this a, a, a drug and violence chase movie, you can call Blood Meridian a Western. <laughs> or you can call uh, Child of God a, a horror flick. <laughs> but these, these, these stories are much more. <laughs> <laughs> and what question is he asking at the end? Um, to, to what extent has the world uh, overwhelmed us exactly. late and soon? Exactly. Yeah. Maybe and maybe not. Do you write? Oh, yeah. What do you write? Screenplays. Are you working on one now? Yeah. I own the, um, um, the, the motion picture rights to Ernest Hemingway's last book. 
And we've made a screenplay of it. And um, we're hoping to be able to shoot it. What was his last book? It's called Islands in the Stream. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It was published posthumously. Right, right. It was really... Did somebody have to finish it? Had he finished it? Yeah, somebody had to finish it. Yeah. It was really three stories right. that his wife, Mary, and the, and the right. publisher sort of tacked together. And the forward to the first edition says that um, Papa was unable to finish this book, but I, I know the changes that he was going to make, and I've, I've done them for him. I've finished his work. You could not argue that that this is his best work because you cannot argue that is that it's his. What is his best work? That I don't know. I've read them all, but I did, I wouldn't presume to say which one's the well, best. Which one do you like the most? Right now, Islands in the Stream. <laughs> <laughs> so, how long have you been working on this, and what are you doing with it? I mean, you're rewrite you you. Tommy Lee Jones is writing the screenplay. Well, it's already written mm, yeah, with I... with uh, my writing partner Bill Whitliff. Right. Um, uh, who uh, did the screenplays for Lonesome Dove and Black Beauty and um, a lot of other movies that you, you may you have You say heard he's of. your writing partner just for this project or otherwise? No, just for this, this project. We're co-authors of the Big, screenplay. Lonesome Dove was an extraordinary adaptation, didn't you think? It was very fine work, and that's why I called Bill first. I said, <laughs> you know, Bill, can you, let, let's go to work Let's on do this, this together. Day. Yeah. How do you do it together? You sit down and you... I wrote a first draft, and it got through about 75% of the screenplay, and I sent it to him. He wrote what I did and added on the end. Sent it back. I rewrote that. I sent it to him. He wrote... So you get the screen, and, and are, is there interest? Yes. Are yeah. you going to make it? I mean, you have a schedule? I wish I could say yes, but we're very close. You got the money? We're Not close. yet. Not yet, but we're very close. And will you play in it? Um, I'm, I'm, yes. Oh, yeah. What's the story? No, it's a story about a, a, a painter who lives in Bimini by himself. Um, his three sons come to visit him. Does he fish? Oh, yeah, he fishes. <laughs> Why would you live in Bimini? Yeah, he's an oil painter. Right. His three sons come to visit him, and um, they, you know, they're from two different mothers, and um, it's a confusing family situation. And um, they come together. They bond together. And... Um, and, when, and after they separate, two of the boys are killed in a car wreck in um, Monte Carlo, and, and one of the boys goes off to um, join the RAF in England and right. um, gets killed, and he's totally alone. He's completely devastated. And um, he leaves Bimini, goes to uh, Cuba, and starts uh, chasing German submarines in his fishing boat. <laughs> I mean, the... the Caribbean was crawling with U-boats right. in uh, 1941. And the Atlantic and nearly Coast. Won the and war. so was the Atlantic Coast. Yeah. Yeah. So he's, he goes to work for the Cuban government. And they, they, they find a, a, a wrecked uh, crew of German submariners, and they chase them down and, and engage them in a final battle. I mean, you've got these men, older men, going through wrenching experiences, trying to come to grips with a world they don't know, mm -hmm. or a world that's been rocked by some unforeseen event. Yes. The death of a son. Mm -hmm. well, it's violence, the unimaginable violence. The advent of the, it's about art, family, right, and right. the advent of the Second World War. And, um, and you know, what it takes to uh, wage war against fascism. Would you direct this as well? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. You, you wrote the screenplay. Yeah. You'll produce it. Yeah. You'll direct it. Mm -hmm. You'll star in it. I act in it. You were, I mean, well, act in it, fair enough. You're the consummate filmmaker in this case, then. That's, that, that's really my ambition, yeah. Yeah. In, in No Country, it is said that one of the other people they thought about was Clint Eastwood, that they needed the kind of gravitas that the two of you bring. I yeah. Mean, there's not a point here other than when you said consummate filmmaker, you think of someone like him. It's the pe two people that can play, you know, a, the kind of character where you really do have to... Uh, I, uh, yeah, well, I, I mean, um, I appreciate being mentioned in the same sentence with Clint. He's a, uh, a friend and, and certainly a heroic uh, character in all, every filmmaker's life. It seems to me that you are somebody who lives by his own code, who defines the kind of life he wants, who uh, has done pretty much what he wants to do, who's found satisfaction in the career that he sort of 
got into early on. And there's been an evolution. You had a chance to play good and bad, uh, heroic and non-heroic. I mean, it's not, I guess this is a long-winded question, is that this has been a rather interesting journey with little complaint, yes? No, I, I don't have any complaints. Um, it, it's, um, I'm 61 years old and, and it, um, it, it, you know, you, you feel a little bit more soreness, physical soreness at the end of a polo match than I did 30 years ago. And that's regrettable, but inevitable. So what the hell? Otherwise, no regrets at all. Mm. Besides, I, you know, getting older. Well, but the more you do, it seems the more opportunities you get to do more things. Oh, we're you know, very happy. Very happy in life and um, hoping to do better. Come back. I will. Thank you, Tommy Lee Jones. Yes, sir. Thank you, Charles. Uh, let me give you the dates on this. In the Valley of Elo is in theaters now. You can see it at the opening of the New York Film Festival, No Country for Old Men, uh, Friday, November 9th, and nationwide on Wednesday, November 21st. Tommy Lee Jones, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.